do a little liturgy intro. All right. So you can hands on your legs. We're going to join heaven and earth. So you just breathe in. Inhale as you bring your arms up, and then exhale as you bring your arms together. Okay. Gather a little love, joy, peace, and enlightenment in your hands. And you're just going to wash it into your body, wash it into your face, your brain, soak it into your neck, your throat, shoulders, run it down your back, arms and hands. Heart, chest, lungs, ribs, liver, gallbladder, spleen, stomach, and chest, abdominals, hips, kidneys, and spine, legs, and feet. All right, let's do that again. Breathe in. Pull the, that energy outside of your head, then you're going to sweep across your body, figure eights. Scoop up love and peace from the earth, join the light from the sky, and then bring that down as you exhale. You're going to inhale from the root chakra, so you breathe in to your lips, and then you exhale with your affirmation and healing from within. Healing from within. And healing from within. And then we're going to do some chi breaths, so you focus on the energy between your hands. In and out, so you breathe in all the way into your nose. As you bring your hands out, and then you blow it out. It's like you're blowing out candles. All right, relax. And um, invoke the power of your higher consciousness or your higher power or whatever it is that you believe in for the benefit of everyone here and for the benefit of what we're about to go over. So um, hopefully uh, we get a good solid recording out of this because there were, uh, I guess, requests for it at the Wellness Center. We've done We've done it before and really broken it down. We're going to really condense it today, and you've got your hand out to really condense it. Um, so why does this stuff work? Uh, that When I do this, uh, what we've been doing in the previous weeks with John, why does it work? And so we're going to go through, just kind of set it up, and different quotes from different sources that I want to make sure everybody has an awareness of. Um, so yes, yeah, so the presentation is The Science of Body Hacking Your Brain for Healing and Success. Also, Acupressure Tapping for Mental Trauma. And um, so we'll get right into it. Um, the first the first thing that I want to point out is from this book. It's from Power Versus Force, Hawkins, and a phenomenal book. Um, Hawkins is the is the doctor that's. What is it? I mean, from what do you? Does anybody know anything that they want to say about David Hawkins and the Power Versus Force? About maybe with what his motivation was. You don't know? These are the guys that in the 60s, so in the 60s and 70s, American Western doctors got really interested in Eastern medicine and the mind-body connection. Cartesian dualism started in Europe with Rene Descartes and Hey, what's up? Hey. I was going to say that. I'm so sorry. That's all right. Yeah, just, well, I'm, well, I'm just glad to have you. I've got the hand out right here. I want to record you. Is that okay? Oh, okay. I'm so, yeah, just set up. No. <laughs> Pause. Pause. No, no, no. Go ahead. Okay, so, so continue. All right. Well, we have, we'll have it here, too. So the first thing we're starting off with is power versus force. Um, and what I was just saying is that it, from a Western, as a, we grow up in the Western tradition. In the Western tradition, your mind and your body are viewed as separate things. Okay, and the fa famous uh, philosopher that really starts that's Rene Descartes, the Frenchman. Um, uh, 
Blaise Pascal is not really well, well known as a philosopher. He's a phenomenal philosopher that gives an alternative view. You know Pascal's theorem, phenomenal, intriguing. So, but the, but the, but the dominant view comes from Descartes, which is your mind and your body are separate things. Okay? So it took us, I don't know, 400 years as, a, as Western civilization to be open to the idea that that wasn't, maybe that wasn't so true, right? So by the 1960s, doctors are like, okay, let's see what's the connection between the mental state and the performance of the body, okay? So, so these doctors, and Hawkins is one of the leaders of that, is let's figure out what happens to one simple variable depending upon your state of consciousness. And that was muscle strength. So they just started with muscle strength. So what happens to your muscle strength as, as you go through different mental states or as you maintain certain mental states? So that's... And, and out of the out of the power out of that work, this is a um, 2013 edition. He well, this is actually 2012. He passes in 2013. He's gone now, but they devote their lives to developing the map of consciousness, which is one of the handouts. Okay, so so what? And and this guy comes from the psychiatric medical model. Okay, so Hawkins comes from the hard science, uh, medicine, chemistry model, and uh, transitions into the consciousness as this goes. So what they find is that your body goes strong. Okay. In other words, the more positive your, your mentality is, your muscles actually respond, your body responds to that. Okay? And in the reverse as well. Okay. So, on this page 238 of the 2012 edition, he talks about biochemical analysis. He says, okay, here's the, here's the issue though. When it comes to, say, courage versus fear and its impact on your body, let's say, so the, the lower levels you got, the worst is shame. And then you've got guilt, and you've got apathy, and you've got grief, and you've got fear, and you've got desire, and then you've got anger, and you've got pride. They're not all equally detrimental to the body, but those are the names of the levels of consciousness that are detrimental. So, but here's what he says. This is critical. So, let's say, your whole, let's say you've lived your life in grief. Certain parts of your body are going to resonate with that grief intensely. To the point that it makes you sick. And he says, but by the time these changes are detectable, the disease process is already well advanced in its own self-perpetuating resonances. I mean, the word disease means dis-ease. So, so what, 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 what I can tell you that's, that Hawkins, this is so crucial for people to understand when we're talking about the science of why what we do works is that emotions are energetic frequencies and energetic frequencies over time have a cumulative effect on the organic functioning of your body. Okay, any thought on that? Any comment? Let me read this paragraph and then I want to get your comments. So this is, we could say that the invisible universe of thought and attitude becomes visible as a consequence of the body's habitual response. If we consider the millions of thoughts that go through the mind continuously, it is not surprising that the body's condition could radically change to reflect prevailing thought patterns as modified by genetic and environmental factors. It is the persistence and repetition of the stimulus that, through the law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, results in the observable disease process. The stimulus that sets off the process may be so minute that it escapes detection itself. Okay, so when he says the law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, you can think of that as we hear in the example, okay, if a, if a, if a, a 
Um, NASA shuttle takes off towards the moon, but it's one degree off. The further you go out, the further it's off course, right? That's what it means. The law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions. So we, we, if we start off right, I, I put in here whether it's the observable health process or disease process, right? You're either getting healthier, you're being sustained, and it's minute, and it's not observable by our scientific instruments. That's what he talks about if, uh, if I back up a page. He says it th this way in his, his doctor speak. He says, when the mind is dominated by a negative worldview, the direct result is a repetition of minute changes in energy flows to the various body organs. The subtle, subtle field of overall physiology is affected in all its complex functions, mediated by electron transfer, neural hormonal balance, nutritional status, etc. Eventually, an accumulation of infinitesimal changes becomes discernible through measurement techniques such as electron microscopy, magnetic imaging, x-ray, or biochemical, biochemical analysis. All right? So the change is a cumulative change in yourself depending on your state of consciousness. Okay? And then he says this. This is really important too. If this scheme of disease formation is correct, then all disease should be reversible by changing thought patterns and habitual responses. In fact, spontaneous recoveries from every disease known to humankind have been recorded throughout history. Uh, and I'll, I'll look, I'll scan the headlines because you'll see these stories. If you're open to looking for it and you're neutral about it, you will see miraculous recoveries recorded in the news media. Um, there was a man, and I, I saved, he, he recovered from a, a brain tumor in California, and they have no, uh, he credits, he credits the uh, recovery to prayer. There's, there's no explanation for that. But if you watch the news headlines, you'll see that this, again, this is not some woo-woo guy. This is a doctor who's acknowledging his own evolution here, okay? The other thing that's interesting is it comes to addictions, and that I love on this page. It is said in Alcoholics Anonymous that there is no recovery until the subject experiences an essential change of personality. This is the basic change first manifested by AA founder Bill W., a profound transformation in total belief system with a sudden leap in consciousness. Okay, any thoughts about this page? Yay, nay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good. Go ahead, you were saying. Well. Where would you like me to start? Any, any, anything you want to say? Right, first of all, when you were talking about the first part up here, the law of sensitive dependence on initial conditions, just to share something. Uh, about two years ago, a doctor here that I was going to said to me quite simply, John, we've done just about all medically we can do. The rest is up to you. Mm -hmm. Already knowing that I was a student of these beliefs. Since then, I haven't taken blood pressure pills in two years. I haven't taken pain pills that they were giving me. I haven't taken so on and so forth. And the, and the only thing he can say is keep doing whatever you're doing. Right. But it's based on these principles. Thank you. Now I want to go one further, yeah. only because talking about alcoholism, well I've been sober for 36 years. So I've been through that in every depth and detail and point of it. I was blessed in the very beginning when I got into the program because in 1982 they changed the laws and I was uh, my last DUI, I only had three in two states, <laughs> but the thing was uh, the new law went into effect two weeks after, so I sort of got around that, but they were starting a whole new program of new centers for people coming in because of the new law to be able to work with people in the beginning and there was a gentleman working with me and a lot of people are not aware but there is a council of alcoholism in our government in Washington DC and most people are not aware even in AA so I started researching all of the history because I was going to be part of this foundation the guy that was going to be running it actually died before we could get started he was the one like you he, he had all the, 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 the the, the 
technical knowledge and the degrees to, to be able to do it. I didn't have any of that. I just had practical experience. But my belief is that this whole scheme of things, I was given this information when I needed it most in my life. And it's starting me on a whole new shelf. So I'll, I'll be quite good. Okay, so when you talk about the <laughs> placebo effect uh -huh. is what is me medically recognized, that they'll do the research, they'll, they'll do some pill, they'll say, okay, we're going to have a placebo, and, yeah. and the, the doctor just tells them, even though it's a sugar pill, you're going to get better, and they get better. At sometimes this, the same rate or a greater rate of efficacy than the people who are actually taking the real medication. Well, that's true. Now, in, in AA, because they believe. <laughs> in AA, there is no medication, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, I've also been manager of a men's recovery home, mm -hmm. so I've had a little more background here. But the other part of that is, unfortunately, the percentage of recovery is about 5%. And it's because most people, right, right here, an essential change of personality. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to, first of all, want it and be willing. Those two little things come into play real, real quick. And people will play the game. When I was interviewing people coming into the recovery house, mm -hmm. I knew after about five minutes of talking to someone if they were serious or not. I could tell from, from it. Now, I didn't get into the re working in that until I was years sober because I was studying all of these other things at that particular time. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I put up 80% what because uh, when you were talking about you're getting better, in, in mental health, what's interesting in mental health is that regardless of technique, regardless of the research, so that you've got all these different kinds of therapies, different approaches to people. And what they found is that there's 80% of clients improved on the basis of one single factor that has nothing to do with the science of, or research of whatever technique that you're using. What do you think that one factor is that accounts for so much improvement regardless of whatever technique want. it is? Want. The want to change. Belief. And desire. It's actually the relationship. To what? To what? To the therapist. Huh? It's a good relationship with the therapist. It's just having a relationship and the emotion. When you talk about, so I mean, belief, all the, the words that you said are going to be involved in a good relationship. Go ahead. Okay, that's, that, I understand what you're saying, your relationship with a the therapist. Uh, there's, a good, there's a good connection. However, go ahead. Who is my therapist? Then what, 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 what? Well, in my AA recovery and all these things, who is my therapist? Who is it? Yourself. Who Yourself. <laughs> it was going inside of myself and to other people in different fields and learning from these processes. So, so I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's I, I just, it, there's a, there's, I, I would, I would, we, we'd have to go into the AA. That's a different model than no, uh, talk know. therapy. This, and we'll come back to this thing. It's, it's in, it, this is interesting. That you've got, now AA is a different beast because you've got a sponsor plus you've got your peers. Um, that you're regularly talking to. So how, how does the transformation play differently? It's a, it's a different beast, but it's a great beast. <laughs> they're, both, they're both powerful. You yeah, know? They're both powerful. When you're and there they, with and, a bunch of other alcoholics, no, you're just as screwed up as me. Don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, and, it's, and for a while, and, and actually it is the blind leading the blind, but you'd be surprised what the blind can see. Oh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so that, that's why it's, yes. yeah, it's a different, it's it's a a different, different beast. Thing. In therapy, I don't. I go into it with a, a, to a relationship without that level of addiction. Yes. I've never been an alcoholic, so how can I be successful with an alcoholic? So, so it inter interesting. So, just throwing that out there. We've got both these things going on. That's good. Fa good factors there. So, I appreciate that. I appreciate the push. All right. So, we're going to get into the next thing, <clears throat> and this is a page out of the Power of Now. Okay, so this is page 25. Um, I like, I really like how, so if I asked you the question, what is emotion? And what is what? Motion. Energy and motion? Energy and motion. Energy and motion? I use. Great. Most of the time. Emotion. 
question. It's kind of a, it's kind of a weird question uh, for a lot of people because oh, it's, it's my feelings, which is a circular, uh, begs the question, well, what are feelings? Right. So, energy in motion, here's what he says. Mind, in the way I use the word, is not just thought. It includes your emotions as well as all unconscious mental, emotional, reactive patterns. Emotions, emotion arises at the place where mind and body meet. It is the body's reaction to your mind. Or you might say a reflection of your mind in the body. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so an effective way to think about emotion is, I, I could say it this way, my emotions are the distributed response of my body to what's going through my mind. Okay? So, and this is, the, this is more science, the body's getting ready to fight. So for example, an attack thought or a hostile thought will create a buildup of energy in the body that we call anger. The body's getting ready to fight. The thought that you are being threatened physically or psychologically causes the body to contract, and this is the physical side of what we call fear. Research has shown that strong emotions even cause changes in the biochemistry of the body. These biochemical changes represent the physical or material aspect of emotion. Of course, you are not conscious of all your thought patterns. It is often only through watching your emotions that you can bring them into awareness. What's the stress hormone? Cortisol. Cortisol, right. So cortisol comes, and we can talk about uh, what happens to your body when cortisol is, is what, what happens to you when your body's stuffed with cortisol? Yeah, so cortisol is, uh, is at the root of almost every disease out there. So my background's pharmacist, for those of you that don't know. Uh, cortisol makes blood pressure go up, blood pressure skyrocket. Uh, cortisol, cortisol makes, uh, makes blood sugar go up, so it actually increases both diabetes and heart disease. Wow. Uh, cortisol makes, makes, causes anxiety, depression, uh, PTSD is when cortisol, but on the flip side of that, uh, cortisol wakes us up in the morning. It's that coffee pot in the morning. So there's good and bads of cortisol. I, we don't want to wake up. That's, that's, well, that's, that's the whole it's point. It's stressful, you know? right? But when we're, uh, it depletes the adrenals, so adrenal fatigue, uh, dumps adrenaline, it dumps uh, epinephrine, all things that happen when you get in a car accident or something really makes you really agitated, you know? Um, and yeah. so at the root of everything, cortisol is. Right, so, a problem. so for, for when it comes to cortisol, we can all identify times when it's important. Yeah, it's good. It's important to get out of bed. <laughs> but that's important. <laughs> um, it's important to be able to run into the street and get a child out of the street. So, so yeah, so um, and we'll get into, you know, a little bit of the science of what it does to our goals. You talked about diabetes. Um, we can talk about what happens to our weight when we're in a state of constantly having this cortisol. It, the important thing is, is that, again, we're getting into the science piece here. Strong emotions cause measurable biochemical changes in the body. Okay? So that's power of now. All right? And, and please, please consider the definition or the the one of your definitions of emotion to be the distributed response of the body to what's going on in your mind. I also like energy and motion. I also like that emotions are energetic frequencies that we transmit as well as receive. I also like that emotion, the idea that emotions are feedback frequencies from the universe to tell us what's, how connected we are to our environment. I also like the idea that emotions are the um, intuitive way in which we connect at a quantum physical level with our loved ones wherever they are. So we call it intuition. Intuition. I'm, a, I'm the biggest fan of intuition you'll ever meet. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have, a challenge. We have a challenge. We have a challenge. But I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of intuition. One of the greatest, one of the greatest natural 
abilities you have in your system to advance in consciousness. Right. The greatest tool. This is now the science is about reason and logic and and the, and the yes. hard stuff that we can uh, empirical truths. You know, taste, touch, sight, sound, feel. You know that absolutely. And that, like I said, I've been in this study for 40, 50 years, and so it thrills me when I see science aligning and proving that some of the things I've studied yes. have background yeah. rather than just theory. Because right. I refer to myself as a mystic Christian because I've studied Good. metaphysics, parapsychology, quantum physics, so on and so yeah. forth, because I want to know more. I'm not satisfied just because somebody on the pulpit tells me something. That doesn't even start to get there. Do me a favor and please requite repeat that last phrase that we use it in the power the of emotion the distribution yes. your the, the distribution emotion is the body's distributed response to what's going through our mind and remember the mind is the supercomputer it's oh, the I rational know. Logical supercomputer. So when I talk about the mind, that's kind of the way I'm using it. He uses it in a in a in, a, yeah. in some other ways. Yeah. No, I, I, wanted, yeah. I wanted that. I like how he said that too. Yeah. That drug is so bad. Why you guys? Yeah. Why you guys give yeah, it out? Say what? That drug is so bad to people. Why do you guys give it out? Cortisol is not a drug. Oh, it's a hormone. Cortisol is something our body makes. So I'm with you. Why does our body make it? You know, good. <laughs> what are they so You're this? illegal. No, no. <laughs> we should make no. it illegal, right? And just so you know, I. I've stepped away from pharmacy entirely three years ago. I'm a holistic, uh, natural healer. So I actually believe in what, what I call nature's medicine or God's medicine. This is, uh, this this is Hawkins and, and, this and, is, <laughs> and, and Justin would be peas in a pod because they would be able to talk. If we had Hawkins here, they could sit and rap about all the drugs and what they think of them and how they combine. And so Hawkins could do that too. The thing about Hawkins is that he evolved to the point where he could see that there's something in this intuition thing that, that, that bypasses this, okay? That's, at the, at the end of it all, he says that I, it, the mother's intuition and her love for her children is more powerful than our, our search and rescue teams. To ask the mother. Well, <laughs> well question for <laughs> Dr. J. Unless, unless Dr. they're practicing Dr. Hawkins. <laughs> Thank you. Is yeah. it possible for a traumatic brain, you know, that's to overproduce cortisol. Absolutely. Is that a, is there, I mean, overactive to where, you know. Yeah, so, so, and, and I, I, I hope David gives me an opportunity at the end of this, because this is going to be super complete. Yeah. Uh, but I was going to get into and ask people about what are the tools that we use in life to cope, to cope with anything, you know, to cope with trauma in its, in its nth degree cope with anything there's goods and there's bads right throw us out alcohol throw, okay alcohol is a, is a coping mechanism it's it's a i would lump that into the negative group right mm -hmm. but good bad what do you guys got because Tap, tapping video is video games the video games is one i mean it can be, <laughs> it can be totally bad yeah exercise drugs exercise music. exercise music um uh, aromatherapy uh sex absolutely i love how you laugh He's like, yeah. yeah. No. Oh, yes, I remember it. Carry a big stick, right? You know, no. <laughs> Nature. Nature. Now, EFT. Now, it, I'll be honest. David did this whole le lesson because I asked him to. I, I feel like we, we did this once upon a time. He ran into the science. And um, I got accused just recently, so I didn't tell David this. <clears throat> so uh, one of my staff members got a call, anonymous call. So I, I own a wellness center here in town. She got a call. Uh, and it said something like this. Did you, is your boss Justin? Dr. J, Dr. J. And they go, yeah. And this person goes, did you know that Justin's participating in pagan ritualistic circles of devilism or whatever? And she goes, excuse me? And she goes, he is tapping. <laughs> he's standing in circles with other people and he's tapping. And my, my staff member who knows what tapping is, who knows that my heart and, and who I am, she goes, you have got to get a hobby. You've got to learn to focus on you and learn what tapping is. I gotta go, bye. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? It must look paganistic and it must look ritualistic. You know, and I don't care. Native American. 
Go because ahead. because let, let me tell you a few things that tapping does for you. Okay. Tapping actually, you guys know what epigenetics are? Epigenetics. So the word epigenetics means. Can we wait? Means. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Well, let's, let's keep going. Uh, uh, as soon point. as we get to Good that. Point. As soon as we get to that. Yes. I'm, what I'm I'm setting you up. You can overproduce cortisol <laughs> by trauma. Yes. And tapping is a tool. <laughs> I can help downregulate or stop producing so much cortisol. So so the reason this this yeah. this I'm glad I'm glad yeah. you brought that up because <laughs> this is the comment is why I take the time to set people up, right? So I'm going to set you up with doctor after doctor. We talk Hawkins, we talk, then we talk Tolly, who's one of the best healers in the world. And now we've got this one. So this is the tapping solution for pain relief. You've got that on your next page, page six. Okay. And Ortner's Nick and Jessica, I'm going to comment on both of them, brother and sister who were real estate people. They had the collapse, and then they start. Then they discover this this tapping thing, and then they start to get into the research of it, and they've taken it worldwide. So there's the worldwide tapping summit that they do. So these are phenomenal human beings. Um, now this is, <clears throat> and there's a doctor on pain that does their um, intro, uh, MD. So this is this is Candace Pert. Now Candace Pert is in the 70s when you don't have a lot of female doctors uh, and then you don't have a lot of female doctors in authority and she's at the National Institutes of Health so very woo woo uh, satanic paganist oh, super. Uh, National uh, Institutes of Health secret society Total secret society. Uh, National <laughs> Institutes of Health um, so look at, look at what, notice what it is it was her success in measuring the opiate receptor that provided the scientific basis for what Pert called the body mind. All right? For scientists, measurement is the gold standard. By measuring the opiate receptor, Pert was proving its existence. She explained, she wrote the book, Molecules of Emotion. In other words, motions aren't real, but then, and so we have all these doctors getting, in, like I said, the 60s and 70s, identifying the chemical underpinnings of emotion. What happens in your body chemically, right? So she says, technological innovations have allowed us to examine the molecular basis of the emotions and to begin to understand how the emotion, the molecules of our emotions share intimate connections with and indeed inseparable are indeed inseparable from our physiology. It is the emotions I have come to see that link mind and body. Okay? That goes back to what Tolly said. Emotion is arises where the body and the mind meet. I'll read her sentence again. It is the emotions I have come to see that link mind and body. Pert was a doctor of pharmacology, so she's another Hawkins peer, right? These guys start out in the drug world and the legal drug side of things. An author, an internationally renowned speaker, and her discoveries have allowed us to begin to understand the potential links between chronic pain and emotions. Chronic pain and emotions. The opiate receptors Pert measured are like keyholes. They bind with very specific keys called peptides which she explains are indeed the other half of the equation of what I call the molecules of emotions. When the opiate receptor, which floats on the surface of a cell like a lily pad on a pond, binds with its perfectly fitting peptide, that cell's behavior can change. In other words, at any given moment, a cell's behavior can shift on the, uh, based on which peptide keys are attached to its opiate receptors. On a more global scale, Pert explains these minute physiological phenomena at the cellular level can translate into large changes in behavior, physical activity, even mood, which goes back to Hawkins, right? He's saying these minute changes build. Pert, this is what I love. This is, Pert's research findings have provided a scientific basis for the idea that we can heal diseases in the body by targeting emotions. As Pert shares, this is critical. This is this is so critical for the. You, you don't. We we have we got a disruption. Oh. Okay, well whatever. So they get what they get. It's raining outside. So, 
Um, all right, so the key here is I can't, I can't underestimate the importance of hard science people crossing over when they de devoted their whole career. And it says, she says, uh, as Pert shares, it is the problem of unhealed feeling the accumulation of bruised and broken emotions that most people stagger under without ever saying a word, that the mainstream medical model is least effective in dealing with. Okay, so you've got this top doctor at the National Institute of Health coming to this realization. If we want to heal pain, we need to target some pain. It's the emotion is the key. Yeah. There was chronic pain. What is a chronic pain? Chronic pain. Uh, uh, a pain that keeps reoccurring. It's chronic, lifelong, no reason. No, no, I'm sorry, no scientific reason that we can see. Let's get it, well, let's do that. Yeah. So next page, so page, page eight. And, and I'll, I'll go, go one step further with the pain and emotions. Um, there's a huge body of science right now going into autoimmune diseases. So what is an autoimmune disease? your body is attacking itself. Does this have anything to do with the free radicals? Uh, could. Could yeah. be cortisol, could be, epi we'll get into epigenetics yeah, and all yeah. that. It, it could have a lot to do, I think the body's more complex than looking at just one thing like free radicals, or cortisol for that matter. Yeah. But an autoimmune disease, at, at the most basic level, an autoimmune disease is your body attacking itself. Mm -hmm. So if you've got uh, diabetic diabetes type one, your, your uh, your pancreas no longer produces insulin. Your body killed it for some reason. Uh, thyroid disease called Hashimoto's is your body's attacking your own thyroid. Um, autoimmune disease, lupus, uh, there's so many of them out there now. Fibromyalgia is a one also. They're linking it to once upon a time, you possibly thought that it would be better that you no longer existed. Mm. or that you wanted to take yourself out of the equation. <laughs> and therefore, your body, maybe 10 years later, goes, picks up, picked up on that signal and said, you got it. Wow. We're going to kill you. Yeah, I wish I was wow. dead, is what a lot of pe people have come to. I wish I uh, didn't exist. I wish I didn't exist. Maybe life would be better if I wasn't in this. Maybe oh, my, yeah. my kids would be happier. My wife would be better. My, my, my financial situation. And so they're tying autoimmune diseases to once upon a time saying, and your body picking up and saying, you got it. You don't want to be around anymore, you got it. We'll take out your pancreas, we'll take out your thyroid, we'll take out fibromyalgia, we'll, we'll take that responsible run with it. Wow. Yikes. Now how do you address that with a pill? Right. How do you address that with a pill? Yeah. You don't. Did you have a question? I didn't mean to. Yeah. Keep. Yeah. Well, you just go by the, the, the thing we produced, right? Uh-huh. And that coming into your body at certain times of the year? Uh, certain times of the year? Absolutely. Yeah, but, and, and a lot of it may be uh, trauma from childhood. If, if Christmas sucked and Christmas is rolling around again, guess what? Your body's going to automatically know Christmas is coming. Man, it sucked as a yeah. kid. And cortisol is just going to start releasing. My yeah. husband died at a certain time of year. Not, not, my, not my husband, but you know, a husband or a wife sure, sure. You know, will die at a certain time of year. And guess what? That time of year rolls around. Your body just knows. Well and cortisol is well, released. I was just wondering because I get real, I get real depressed I'll tell you, around October, November, December, and January is I got my kids' birthday, mm -hmm. Thanksgiving, mm -hmm. Christmas, and my birthday in no. January. And there's other chemical I'm things too. That's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. the, the, the sun, there's a lot of things that that could let, be. Let me, let's give one yeah. specific example, okay? Yeah. So this is, you said what causes chronic pain. These are, these are are Here's another one, okay? so. This is page eight, okay? So imagine that you went through a terrible divorce years ago. It needed to happen, and you know you're better off as a result. You feel as if you're over it, but in fact, while the divorce was happening, your unconscious mind, going back to what he said, your unconscious mind buried your rage without your realizing it. That's what the unconscious mind does. It takes over without our knowledge or consent. Over time, the repressed rage limits oxygen supply to your muscles. That oxygen deprivation then leads to muscle constriction, which spreads to nearby muscles. You experience that process every time you clench your fist. 
First, the muscles in your hand tighten. Then almost immediately after, the muscles in your lower arm tighten also. As time goes on, when your muscles remain tight and constricted, you experience pain. Imagine if I, so, so, so make a fist, okay, make a fist, everybody make a fist. And hold it, you have to hold it tight, okay? This is what, this is the, this is the, this is a repressed rage. So you hold your fist as tight as you can, just keep holding it, don't stop. Imagine if I asked you to clench your fist right now and keep it clenched. After a minute, your hand might get tired. After 10 minutes, maybe your hand would ache, then, and then pain would set in. What would happen if you kept it clenched for a whole day, month, or year? Obviously, you would experience pain, muscular degeneration, and all sorts of problems, not just in your hand, but in your wrist and in your arm as well. Eventually, your shoulder would be affected, and so on. Imagine the same thing happening in whatever part of your body is the pain. The tension builds, muscles contract. Blood flow constricts and pain follows. According, and this is one of the other doctors that are that are in uh, the tapping world. Sarno, get, keep going. Come on, are you staying? We're, we're doing chronic pain here. Come on. Okay, according to Sarno, this MD, the only way to treat uh, TMS. Okay, so TMS has what he, this is a term for. Uh, let's see here. We're on page. He calls it. Myo, it says tension myositis syndrome. Okay, myositis means physiological alteration of mu muscle. Okay, so that's J John Sarno. So he says the only way to treat TMS, tension myositis syndrome, is by addressing the underlying emotion that originally caused the pain. When patients become aware of the, the presence of rage or unbearable feelings, these feelings can cease. There's struggle, so you can relax now. You let go of the stress of that past pain and become conscious, right? Removing that threat eliminates the need for physical distraction and the pain stops, okay? Sardo's work shows that we can treat physical pain by finding new ways to access the body-mind and process our emotions in a more complete way, okay? So that's Nick Ortner's Tapping solution for pain relief. And we'll get to the we'll get to the tapping itself. We're gonna keep rolling here. All right. Next one. Let's talk about the body's weight. Talk about fat. Talk about weight gain and loss. That's his sister. So Jessica did the tapping solution for weight and body confidence. Now this is we we've talked a bit about this already. Let me just share what she said. She said you have a pharmacy inside you. At all times, your body is pumping out the hormones and chemicals it needs to function properly. Unfortunately, many of us are taking a drug that in excessive amounts causes weight gain. We take it daily, and the drug is called stress. Stress begins in the amygdala, the almond-shaped component located in the limbic system in the midbrain. Right? The amygdala has been called the body's smoke detector. When it senses danger, it tells our body to initiate a physiological stress response called the fight or flight response. And I like to call it fight, flight, or freeze because not everybody runs away, not everybody fights, some of them just hunker down, right? This creates an overproduction of a hormone called cortisol, which, we've, which studies have linked. So here's more science. Studies have linked to increased appetite, sugar cravings, and abdominal fat. Why abdominal fat? Because when you're fighting and flighting, you don't want to digest food. It's not the time to go to the bathroom. Okay, so digestion stops. So if you're eating and you're stressed out, your body's not digesting it. So where's it going? And you're, not, and you're not absorbing anything. So, so what would be the best thing for you at this moment is vitamins and nutrition and and, and good good foods, but in a stressed state, you can eat. This is why overweight people can come into my store and say, Justin, I am eating the healthiest diet, and yet I'm still fat or I'm gaining weight. How stressed are you? Oh my gosh, I'm incredibly stressed. Because mm -hmm. that cortisol is not going to allow you to absorb wow. the nutrition. Wow. So yeah. So so when we talk about being where whether it's weight loss or healing. Both of those, you need to be in a relaxed emotional state. 
Okay? If, you, if there's one takeaway from these two brother and sister duo and all the doctors that so so you got the reason why Je, Jessica and, and uh, Nick is it Nick? Nick Nick the reason why Jessica and Nick are so important is that these are salespeople <coughs> they're not doctors they come from it from the side where we don't know any of the science and now we're in with all the scientific people so they take all these scientific people and they show them to the world so it's really that's what's great about people like that that they really put on the show to make sure it gets out there to the world all right so i love that um just realizing you cannot your body is not gonna is not gonna perform it's not gonna be it's not it's not as strong it's not as healthy it's not gonna lose weight it's not, go ahead. sorry but even that so so fight or flight and, and if you think about it, it shuts down every system that's not needed so in the, the experience Good. i always say is, is if a lion was this is back in the the paleolithic days but if a lion was chasing us it would shut down our sexual function, it would shut down our long-term memory, it would shut down our digestive well, system, yeah. it would shut down all these because you don't need it to fight or flight this, this line, right? This is why people have been known to have lifted a car off of somebody in a, in a moment of, of really need, because their body shut down every system that wasn't needed. So I, you know, you'll get people that, my memory zapped, uh, uh, you know, younger people that are like, I'm trying to procreate and yet, you know, nothing's happening either they don't desire sex or their sexual organs aren't working to the to the extent it needs to because their body shuts it all down so even fight or flight will just shut down everything that's not necessary yes yeah, so to keep us in that fight mode that flight mode that freeze mode would you say stress and uh, uh, miscarriage could be absolutely yeah, right as your body's trying to why would we care about this we're trying to fight abort can yeah. people yeah. stay in that in that that frame that frame or that frame of mind or that uh, state for an elongated period of time? I would say this society... Decades. Decades. <laughs> oh. That's, that's yeah. right. That's right. We live, we live, and, and when I've talked about, I've, I've compared, okay, let's say you have PTSD. PTSD, if you've got it, you know, uh, it's like living in a building. We're in this, we're in this, this building here that used to be a school. It'd be like living in a school where the fire alarm is always going off. It's like, wow. Is this a real emergency? Because it, it just feels like the usual. <laughs> I can't tell. Well, in, in, in two, two stories that I can think of, uh, one, cancer. When people are immersed in the, the medical field, cancer remedies, uh, chemo, radiation, you know, stress, 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 cancer may or may not be alleviated. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm just saying it doesn't work very often. 2% of the time doesn't work. So you've heard of people that say, screw it. They leave the whole, they, they, I, and I know people that have, they said, screw it, I'm going on a cruise, I'm gonna go see the world, I'm gonna max out my credit card so when I die, big whoop. And they end up getting better from cancer because they're, they're like, screw it. Mm -hmm. they, they totally alleviated the stress out of their life. Now they're just living a life of, of comfort and love and, and desire. And now they're not in this fight or flight, they're in this rest and digest is what it's called. They're resting, they're, they're, and their body's healing. And uh, a second situation real quick that I can think of is the um, uh, same thing happens in the, in the pregnancy world. When people are uh, trying to get, uh, uh, you know, they're trying to suck out a sperm, and then they're trying to suck out an egg, and then trying to incubate them. And it's very stressful for the man or the woman that are in that medical model. But the second they just say, you know what, we'll leave it in God's hands, and, you know, we're, we're just going to, if we're not meant to have children, it's not meant to be, they end up having a child then. It's crazy. It's like, what happened? Pressure's were, off. Pressure's off. Wow. The stress is off. The cortisol is out. The you know. So there's an old saying, and a lot of people don't like to hear it. You don't get cancer from what you eat. You get cancer from what's eating you. And huh. you're just just using it a different format right there. It's a good. And that's a very ancient good. saying. But when you look at it, see, we are our own worst enemy, or we are our best friend. And I owe you an apology. You were talking about who was my guide and come. At that same time, uh, when I was getting sober, I took a course that, ever, that was the original, as far as I know, of everything that's on this page right here. And that was the Sedona Method that I shared on. And Lester Levinson was my instructor and guide in letting go of all of my negative emotions on the first go around. So yes, I did have someone working with me. I didn't dawn on it, y'all glass, wait a minute. And that so happened, you had a relationship I with I had a relationship with well, he is the only other person in my life I've ever known that if he walked into this room right now, everybody would stop what they were doing and look to see what energy he had. Excellent. 
Excellent, because the next page in your handout is the, and I can make more, is the map of consciousness. Okay? Now, when it comes to these frequencies, and, and that's where we, we're starting, we've got to introduce the frequencies from the power versus the force, because you, uh, Lester, Le Lester Levinson. Lester Levinson. He was given he, three months to live, and he lived for another 30 years, and he developed the, the system Sedona, that this was built on. He did the Sedona method? The Sedona okay. method. Okay. All right. So, so what I want to say about the Lester Levinsons of the world, and we'll, we'll develop this thought further, is that we can't measure it yet, but we'll, we'll progress to the point where eventually we'll be able to measure where somebody is on this map. Sweet. And yeah, wouldn't that be something if we could measure whether some, what, we could come up with some means and, 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 and sense, we can, what we can do is we can tell how the electrical flow in microwattage as, and compare that. So there's much more electricity flowing through somebody in terms of microwattage at, at a higher level of consciousness than a lower level of consciousness. You said that it affected people to be in his presence. Um, in, in Power versus Force, Hawkins talks about how teachers, true teachers, or gurus uh, enable people to maintain a higher level frequency so that they can change. And it's, diff it's difficult for people to change without a relationship with someone who has a higher level of consciousness. See, I actually have experienced so many teachers. It, it, it's truly amazing. It, 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 and they just appear out of nowhere sometimes. Yeah. It, and, and that's part of it. Yeah, the presence of a true teacher and the criteria being of a true teacher are what? What's the criteria of a true teacher? Anybody? It's a true teacher will never control your life in any way. A true teacher merely explains to you how to expand or how to evolve your consciousness, how it progresses. That's all a true teacher does. And before they ask you for your money. No, they don't. They don't ask you for anything. A true teacher is just dedicated to, to your growth and to growth itself. Okay? And they don't want to control you. They don't want to control you. So the moment you, if you can just, if you went through your life, the rest of your life, measuring teachers by those two criteria, you would have a gold standard for, for how you operate. Okay? For how you operate in your relationships and identifying a healthy relationship with the true teacher. Okay, so so I'm just introducing. This is the map that's developed by the Hawkins crowd and the uh, Lester Levinson crowd. I wish you could see my worksheet on this. Idea. I'll that, take that. that. I'll just hold it up. Uh, the worksheet is this big, and we wrote down every emotion we had in every category. Right. And we went through it. This was done not in a day or two. I can assure you. But it was a phenomenal thing, and the beauty of it, and the beauty of it here, with this gentleman right here, when he's working with someone in this room, and you're seeing it, you're also feeling it, and you're also being into that vibration, mm -hmm. and you're getting healing energy, whether you can accept it or realize it or not. And I just want that to be known because that energy is there, and when that healing is taking place, uh, it's contacting you right now, right where you are. And I think that's just something people need to realize that it can happen okay. like that. So that 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 speaks to um, so I didn't include this in the handouts, but it's page three hundred two of Power versus Force, where he talks about we have we have established. He says um, he says there there are counterbalances. There are counterbalances energetically, and anyway, he says the difference in power between a loving thought. Um, 10 to the 35 million microwatts and a fearful thought 10 to the 750 million microwatts is so enormous as to, beyond, as to be beyond the capacity of the human imagination to even comprehend. So, so, the, the, so there's one leap that you have, to, you have to take, you take with Hawkins. Hawkins is going to take you to the leap that, uh, and this is something you have to decide for yourself, and it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't, it's not going to impede what we're about to do, but Hawkins is and, and Levinson are, are going to say, look, not only does your emotional state impact your body, it impacts everybody around you and everything around you. In other words, the more you, and, and, it's, it's, and, it's, 
and it's a logarithmic expansion. So the more positive a person you become, genuinely loving, genuinely compassionate, the more impact you have, as you were saying, when you're with those people in that relationship, we'll get to the point scientifically where we can measure that person's literal energy going into who they're trying to help. This is still being taught, not by him anymore, but on an international level in just almost every country you could name. And it's being taught to this day. Uh, I don't agree with the new person's viewpoints quite as much as I did Lester, but I knew Lester. And so, so I find it interesting. But I see what's happening here is part of the same global expansion that's going on in the consciousness and the consciousness fellowship. And so I see it happening in many, many yeah. levels. And that's what I see. Yes, it's phenomenal because, uh, yeah, so, so keep in mind, that's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the distinction, is that Hawkins is going to go to the next step, which is you are impacting the people around you and your environment, and you're transmitting your frequency outward, okay? And you can decide that for yourself. If you think about experiences you've had with people where you could feel them, yeah. Or they came into the room and the room changed. You, you talked about that example. Those are examples you'd have to look at in your own life. If you feel like, oh, I just got a dark cloud around me and I'm affecting everybody around me, or the opposite. I'm just vibing great stuff here and, and people are changing and people are happier when I come. You know, so, go ahead. What's that first word, David? This one? Uh -huh. Gambling? Who? Gambling. Oh, gambling? Yeah, I haven't got to this. Negative. Haven't got to this yet, but that, um, yeah, it's just my PTSD tree. So, uh, yeah. I, I was talking to a woman yesterday that said uh, she was talking about a um, caretaker in hospice, and how at the end of the day, she, the caretaker said that just the energy off of somebody being sick will liter literally drain them uh, physically and mentally, and you can feel it. They said when they touch you, does that does that have the same sort of thing, but in a negative? Yeah. So so can we can we can we measure that? Not yet. But is it, but what I say it's hap it really happening because that person in hospice, what is their emotional state? What's the person when a patient goes into hospice? What's their emotional state going to be? Look at the map of consciousness. Where do you think if I'm in hospice, and we're talking about. 80% of human beings are going to live and die down here. 50. Hopeless. There you go. So if I'm in hospice, if I, if I'm, unless I'm a highly conscious person, unless I'm highly conscious, if I'm an average person, my emotional state will probably be a despair. So, so that would be what I'm talking about is I'm the caretaker of a person who's stuck at level 50. And Hawkins says the only people that can actually operate in that even tread around that are Mother Teresa types. You don't even dare go to Calcutta unless you are vibing at a high level frequency because it will just suck you in. But there are techniques to set up defenses, but if you haven't studied them, don't think you can just sit and read a book and do it. It really does require guidance. But there are techniques where you can shield yourself against that energy and not be affected by it. But they're very involved. And, and, and today we're, we're primarily focused on the individual. I'm just, I'm acknowledging that Hawkins goes a step further. Yes. And Lester Levinson would have gone a step further, that you're impacting the people around you, okay? So the next thing is, okay, so the important thing that I want you to take out of this page is that this is the development. This, this map of consciousness, this is the, one of the best gifts I can give you. This is not a therapy, this is a life path. And it shows you, and the way it works is it's a staircase from the bottom up. Each level, or each row, is a step. I don't have that other one with me that shows the color shift up. Mm -hmm. uh, the beauty of it is, where, where you think is where you're reaching a plateau, is the beginning of an expansion you can't even imagine. When you have gotten up to this 600 and above, you're opening, that's not the top of the, the, of the chart, but you're opening up to a, an adventure that you cannot even imagine. It, you, you really are, because that's when you're getting, coming into the, your own wholeness as a human being, uh, connected with your true self. 
So, so should. yeah, the, when you're talking about being around people who are doing this work, this is an evolution. These things have to be processed. And what I'm saying to you is that we're talking about the reason why I bring up this energy is because we're talking about getting into the science of how to get the body to be open to new energy, how to get the body and the mind to be open to releasing negativity. Okay, so the, the map is, is when people say my emotions and feelings, the map gives you a lot of vocabulary too yeah. to contemplate. And so what I'll say to somebody is I'll just say, once I give them this map, I'll just say, I want you to put this somewhere where you're going to see it every day. And all I want you to do when you look at it is ask yourself, where am I and where do I want to be? Just being conscious that of, of what I've told you already, without any technique, just that, it will change your life for the better. Because you will you go into it knowing, if I stay on this frequency, if I stay at the frequency of fear, the physical process is withdrawal, withdrawal from life. Okay, that's the process calm. So it tells you what the process is. I will view life as frightening. <laughs> My general emotion will be anxiety, okay? So it, it, it gives you an explanation of what will go, be going on in your life. And, and I'll tell you this, I can't tell you what will happen in your life specifically if you stay in these low level frequencies. I can tell you it'll be bad, okay? These frequencies will kill you. They will make you sick. They will harm you. I mean, particularly shame. Shame is the level where you hate yourself so much that you actively pursue eliminating yourself. Right. When you embody shame as a living uh, frequency. No, David, would you tell them how many, how much percentage of people are below the state of the science? Okay, so the science uh, and the measurements uh, uh, for Hawkins were seventy-five percent. Excuse me, eighty-five. Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. It is eighty-five. Eighty-five percent of all. He said eighty-five. The world. Mm -hmm. He said eighty-five. I think we're doing better now. I think we're doing and the reason why I say that okay. is because we're okay. here having this conversation. And uh, How long ago did he say that? I'm sorry. So, so he writes, this is 2012. Okay. This is 2012. And the faster, the, the internet is changing everything. The internet is changing the world in, a, in this positive way because people are able to learn about this stuff and learn about these teachers and order their books and, in, in Asia and in the Middle East. And, now, and in Africa and in Latin America. So the people, and then start translating them. Okay, so that's huge. That's enormous. That's enormous. So that is, that's the best use of the internet I have ever seen. That's right. That's and right. right now, today, I'm amazed because India and Finland are the two leading countries in the world with the treatment and the raising of children and teaching, accepting children as they are, and helping them to develop in their own natural state. They're so far ahead of our education system in this country today, it's a sin for this country. It's starting to wait and recognize it, but where they are is phenomenal. And it, it's, you can find it all if you go, go to YouTube and do a little research. But I have some books Good. that I was given 15 years ago that are so advanced over what we're talking about right here. And I didn't even open it up until a year ago. I've had this book for 15 years. I wasn't ready for it. So here's what here's what's so important to me. And this, and when you talk about the, the internet as an expression of our collective consciousness, when we look at the internet and everything on, it's us. That's our human family. That's it's an ex, good and bad, right? So this is this is an ex, this is the minority. This it's it's 20 20 percent of us. I I'd, I'd say 20 percent of us are somewhere in these positive realms. So. Our job is to continue to pump this out as, as efficiently and, and lovingly and effectively as we can. We're going to make progress. There's no doubt about it. Um, what, what I'm telling you and everything that we're working towards to this technique, the, 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 the conviction that I have is that this, this process that I'm sharing, this body, what I call the body hacking, what's called the EFT tapping, emotional freedom technique or active pressure tapping, it can take a person from here uh, all the way up. It can take it can take you it can get you from down here. It can take somebody from being suicidal, from hating themselves, up to being courageous and productive and working and maintaining a marriage and 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 being in loving relationships. It can take a person and do that. Okay, that's that's what's so important to me is that we're not just 
not only, I mean, it's one thing to have the map, and then it's another like, okay, so how do I get there? What's, what do I do? So I'm just contemplating it. Well, is it, knowing this exists will improve you. Just knowing that this is the map, and this is the map that the doctors work on. Nobody, nobody's ever given you a map. Now you have a map. We got lots of maps. Mm -hmm. And I know I've known so many people. They'll go take a course. They'll go study with somebody. They'll say, "Oh, it was so great." Two weeks later, I'm talking about they're studying another course. If you don't apply it, if you don't go within it, you a lot, most people don't give themselves permission to grow or permission to awaken to or permission. And that's one of the biggest things I run into. You know, is, is you need to realize. Or you say, "Oh yes, oh I can do this." Now, you say, "I will do this." Now, will you give yourself permission to do it? Because you say it to agree with people, usually from the first. Okay, and here's a, here's a big problem. Because in the brain, the when you're traumatized, when you have a traumatized brain, your brain tells you not to work on it. <laughs> there you go. Because your brain, the way, PTSD, the way trauma works, it says, this is what trauma says to you. It says, don't look at it. If you look at it, bad things are going to happen. So any of you have trauma, or things, you know, trauma you're deeply embarrassed about, you're ashamed that it happened, you're very sad about it, and we talk, and we're going to get, you're going to have your time to talk about the coping stuff and all the ways we distract ourselves from the actual work. You talk about doing the work, your part of you is invested in loving, lovingly, it thinks it's love. It thinks it's love, but it's just trying to keep you safe, and it's not real love. It's not the real love. It's fear. And fear, you know, how many, how many, how many times have you heard uh, parents express fear as if it was love for their children? I'm so worried. I'm so worried. I'm so worried. That's not love. That's fear. Okay, but you're calling it love and concern when it's actually fear. Uh, love is more confident, supportive, nurturing, which is... It's, it's, just, it's willing to go for it. Now we're going to get into this one. You were holding this book up. That's the next one. So The Promise of Energy Psychology. And this one, so as a therapist, so I come from, from the, you know, the, the professional side of it. I'm talking to people in, in, in sessions. I'm watching them freak out. If we try to go, if, if, see, not only, not only does your brain not want to talk about it, but then your body starts doing all sorts of stuff that are panic attack symptoms. You know, and your headaches, and your, your throat aches, or your tightness, and your, your, your chest hurts, your heart rate changes, just when we start to bring up certain topics, right? Your body, your stomach it gets sore, your, you get tingles, people's bodies start, they start to cry. So, so not only does your brain say, don't look at it, your body says, no, 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 no. Be afraid. Be very afraid, right? So, so I realized early on as a therapist, I need, if I'm going to be of any use to these people, there's got to be something going on out there. And that, I came across this. I came across this um, Promise of Energy Psychology. David, David Feinstein, Harvard Psychologist. Here's, here's, and this is important. Harvard Psychology. Do you think a Harvard psychologist wants to be called a devil worshiper? Right. What was it? It was something. It was a paganist. Paganist. Yeah. yeah. So do you think a guy from the top university in the world, one of the top universities in the world, that has prided himself and is going to is going to publish a work and in, 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 that? I mean, he's he's got to be healthy in himself. Well, he's, he's putting himself out there. Yeah. yeah. Saying saying. I may be ridiculed for this. Yeah. And so you're right, he has to be very secure with himself. So it took him three decades before he would write the book. He had to be doing this energy side of things for three decades. So this comes out in 2005, okay? So, so 2005. And, and then the con and historical context is really important because historical context helps us understand why we're progressing collectively at a specific rate because it takes time for mainstream scientists and mainstream psychologists to say, we got to look at this. We got to look at this. Um, so this is out of the intro. He says, 
And this is this is stuff you've already kind of we've already, already talked about. He says, he he quotes he quotes Candace Pert. So he quotes Candace Pert in the foreword. Actually, excuse me, Candace Pert wrote the foreword. That's why it sounds like Candace Pert. Candace Pert writes his foreword for him. Okay, where she says it right here again: the bi biochemicals underpinnings of, of awareness of sensations such as pleasure and pain, drives such as hunger and thirst, and emotions, blah blah blah. Right. The Here's, here's, here's something that, that I love that she says it differently here. He says, the emotions, the molecules of emotion shape mood and thought. It's a two-way process. Emotions and thoughts initiate a series of cascading chemical and cellular events, including the formation of new neur neurons. So just keep that in mind. There's a cyclic connection. I'm emotionally feeling a certain way. I'm emoting this way. It's doing my chemistry this way. My chemistry is actually becoming the basis when you physically feel a certain way, it changes the way you think. Because if you feel something in your body and you feel these emotions, then that becomes the basis for new thoughts. How many of you, I mean, you know if you pay attention that you've sat and analyzed your physical state, what the meaning of my physical state is. Or you're feeling a certain way in your body and you sit and then you start analyzing it. You know what I'm saying? Pay attention because you're, I'm feeling something in my body and I start analyzing it. So that's another way. So that's the other side of it, where your body's operating in a certain way. How many times do people get depressed or anxious about something that's going on in their body that come into your store? It's an immune store. Hardly any. Because they're not in their present. Good. What's the name of your store? It's called Trump Wellness Center. So if somebody's having certain symptoms in, in, in their body, or they, it, it, when, when they come into my office, uh, like I was talking to a teenager yesterday, he can feel, he can feel like um, his, he can feel his, like his, his state, like he feels almost like changes in his body where he kind of feels separate from it. And then he has to sit and analyze or he'll have moments where he kind of like physically zones out. And, it, and, and, the, and so he's trying to figure out what it means. Is it something medically that's going on or is it something that it's based on his trauma? So it's, it's interesting when we, when we talk about how how, and, and from my perspective, things go on in people's bodies and then they still sit and analyze those things. So, um, anyway, it's the two way street. And it can be positive or negative, this, this process. All right. So, and then there's one thing I want to share out of here that is in your handout. Um, he says this. Now, David Feinstein married Donna Eden, energy practitioner. So she's the woo-woo person, and he says this. He says, after more than three decades as a clinical psychologist carefully monitoring the field's developments, I find that the energy approach presented in this book is the innovation that has made the most profound difference in helping my clients. So, very paganistic, right? So you got a top psychologist from a top university in the world and saying this is the biggest thing that I've seen make the biggest difference. Well, and, and, and so, so the reason I said nobody comes into my store telling me about their emotions is because they're still coming in asking if there's a pill to fix oh. it. So they come into my store saying, is there a pill to fix how I'm feeling? Yeah. And I'm helping them understand this part Good of it. Point. So, so if you want to look at the more paganistic rituals, it's coming in trying to take a pill and not address you. In my opinion, that's the more ritualistic thing is well what's an herb what's a seed a weed a weed i mean what's what's something i can do to just numb myself and not address me you know yeah so, good i don't know all right so with then, you. final book final book for the day is this one so so now we've gone to the level where you have jack canfield who's a success coach so like i said you've got the, the nick and jessica order people jack canfield wrote what books Chicken soup, Chicken for, the soup soul. for the soul. Hundreds of them. Millions and millions of copies. Super human being. Success coach. He writes success principles. I think that's around 2000. Uh, we could look it up. 2000, early 2000s. This, um, and then he teams up with one of these acupressure people to do this. Because... He realizes, my people, uh, we've got all the right teachings. Why aren't people more successful? 
So he starts to get into the science side of it. And also Tony Robbins. So if Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield are both big into this. They don't do it like openly. It's not how they lead. <laughs> It's not, it's not their leading technique, but it's something they have in the background that people are ready to do with their students. Okay. Um, in this case, it's Pamela Bruner. Um, I think it's Chloe Mandanes for Tony Robbins. Okay. Okay. This is page six of that book. Now, this is this is where I've set. Okay. What are the what are the three things that we have to have in alignment? For, 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 for this, for being, being able to heal and succeed? Consciousness. Yes, your conscious mind. Subconscious. Your subconscious. Body and soul. And your body, organs, nervous system. See, it doesn't matter to me whether or not somebody thinks what I do, what we do, is paganistic, satanic, or not. I'm going to tell them the same thing. You, if you want to heal from trauma, and fundamentally, and really, I'm telling you, when, when it comes to moving up the map of consciousness, and consciously knowing it, the clients that, that succeed, that heal fast, so you don't just heal, you don't just heal from the pain, but you start succeeding in life, you start winning, you start doing great things. Are the clients that use techniques that are gonna do this? You're gonna align your conscious mind with your subconscious mind, and your body's gonna get in, in agreement with it. Now this is what he says here. He says, you, when, he, when he says on page five, it's not here, he just says, what we've learned about the brain has changed. The brain remains elastic throughout your whole life. Assuming it's healthy, you can always learn. And that can work for you or against you. And so he says here, when we experience a trauma or something that triggers a negative emotion, we create neural pathways that support re-triggering the negative emotion. Okay, so there's again, there's another scientific component. Your brain actually forms a new neural pathway when you have a traumatic event, event happen. And that new neural pathway is, is expressed through a belief system that changes my beliefs about myself, my family, and my world. Okay? That's how you know you've been traumatized. Because it changed, changed your life. It changed the way you saw yourself. Well, I heard it explained uh, at one time that your brain is like a coral reef, constantly uh, growing. Uh, yeah. It can shrink. It can change. But how, but how, do, how do we um, uh, get the negative out of there and turn it into a positive. Good. That's what we're working to. I promise. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> okay. In this question. The, so notice this. So for, so first we got to understand that when you have a trauma, you it, your brain creates neural pathways that support re-triggering the negative emotions. Right. You can be re-triggered once that trauma gets locked in. That gets programmed. As an example, if you have an experience that causes you to believe that people are mean and dangerous, you will look for evidence. To support this belief and ignore evidence to the contrary. Right? So your brain starts computing looking for it. Okay? We also create pathways that support limiting or disempowering beliefs that we may have created in the moment of the trauma. This process of creating pathways is so fast, in fact, that Nobel Prize winner Eric Cannell says we double the neural connections for a given thought. We can double the neural connections for a given thought pattern in only one hour. So if we're pumping the thought out and we're obsessing over it, I suck, I suck. I, you know, I, I did something embarrassing happened, you know, to a little kid. Maybe a little kid has an accident when they're in a class and their kids, their classmates, that was, that was a case I was working on earlier this week, that, that they're made fun of because they had an accident in, uh, in, their, in their, you know, in their classroom. So, what was what's pumping through that kid's head, right? How many neural connections are made from that early childhood, adverse childhood experience, right? Well, and vice versa, when you guys hear what the emotional freedom technique tapping can do if you do it for an hour only, what it does to reverse a lot of that crap. Okay, well, I'm excited. It's, it's, it's very exciting. I'm so, not anyway. excited. I'm excited. 
So, so Freud was saying, look, what happened in your life in your early childhood is important. But, it, but, it, but the problem is, is that he believed insight, and Freud is awesome in his ways, okay? You tell us that our child is important, that was new, okay? Historical context is important. He was phenomenal in certain ways. But he felt that if you have enough insight, if we could just sit and talk about it enough, that would work. And um, I'm telling you that's not the case, and that isn't the case. You know that even though somebody tells you something rationally, simply understanding your fears and limiting beliefs, however, does not usually give you the ability to overcome them. I know it's irrational that I don't want to speak in front of people, or I know it's irrational that I don't want to drive. I need to be able to drive a car. I know that's irrational, but I can't get over my fear. You may consciously know that flying is safer than driving a car, nevertheless, that this doesn't prevent his subconscious mind from creating certain symptoms every time he boards an aircraft. And the subconscious mind is the elephant. The conscious mind is the rider. The elephant is more powerful. Your subconscious mind is more powerful. That's another takeaway. Um, I mean, that's the supercomputer that's recorded everything and all the emotions, everything that you suppress so far that you can't even remember. You know, you suppress it consciously to the point that it becomes repressed, and I can't even remember it now. Um, so, so, tapping. Tapping, what is tapping? Tapping is, is the process of a, a specific points on your body that map out, that create a piezoelectrical charge that goes to your brain and to an accompanying organ in your body. Okay. So the reason tapping will interrupt the process of the fear. Tapping sends a signal to the brain to react with calm, not with fear upset. It has been proven to dramatically reduce cortisol levels. That's proven. Science. Proven. Tapping reduces cortisol levels. This, in turn, reduces stress. Okay, so piezo... Well, uh, there's different ways to say this. Piezo... So, piazzo, piazzo, pizzo, piezo. If I, okay, you, you can say it any way, almost any way you want. Piezo. Piezo electric charge. Pe pizzo. Piezo. Okay, you can't go wrong. It's, but piezo electric means press or squeeze. Piezo is the Greek for press or squeeze. What is, what's piezoelectric? Does anybody know, anybody have a piezoelectrical? What's piezoelectrical? What is that, what is that? What is, anybody, who knows? Okay, pizza. here's, it's all you see is pizza. Pizza. Pizza electrical. Pizza electrical. Sounds good. Pizza electrical. It's lunchtime. Um, piezo. Okay, so, so if you, we, piezo. You can think like, you, you can pretend you have an, a, an Italian in your family. You say piezo, that'll help you to remember. Right? Like this paragraph. Say, what's the, which paragraph is it? The one you earlier, tapping creates the... Okay, the let's... let's the the okay, so tapping creates the piezo. Charge that tri piezoelectric charge that travels through the connective tissue along the path of least electrical resistance when a traumatic memory is recalled, along with the awareness of the site in the body that holds the, the primary memory of the trauma, tapping introduces a message of safety to the body that is not congruent with the emotionally arousing memory. And I've sat in that chair with you doing this work on me enough times to realize what you're doing. Yeah, well, that's the thing is that I'm going to tell to the to the fundamentalists that don't believe us, just, okay, I'm all about what works, and that's, that's what flying scenes did. So just try it and go with me. Now, just a bit on the science, a bit on the science. The piezoelectrical effect is the transfer of mechanical energy, right, into electrical energy. This is mechanical energy transferred into electrical energy. That's it. And if you study the piezoelectrical effect, this energy can be stored. It can charge up. Okay? So you could have a battery attached to this. And I would charge that battery just doing this. 
it wouldn't charge a battery. And you're going to hook up to a switch. And you can flip the switch on, and this would light, light up the light. Oh, I can drive to that when I'm driving. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the Car that that's on piezo electrical <laughs> effect. Okay? Mechanical, in, that's all it is. Mechanical energy to electrical energy. And you can create an alternating current. Just doing this. So, next, next page. So now, what I've got here, and you can get these online, anybody who's, we've got the chart. So our, our, our Chinese brothers and sisters spent the last thousand, couple thousand years developing a chart and identifying which emotionals, uh, emotions resonate with which organs and which acupressure points connect to the brain to which organs. So that's why the chart. So if you want, so you, need, you have the, the specific points. Notice, going back to the paragraph um, that uh, you liked, he says, he says, when a traumatic memory is recalled, along with the awareness of the site in the body that holds the primary memory, okay, the, the site in the body, we, when we do the tapping, we do the full series of tapping points. We're going to tap on every point to every major internal organ. Yeah, so we're going to tap. the same page. You didn't put it in the same page. Did, the same. Did I mess up? <laughs> That's possible. Oh, sweet. Two of them. Rip it out. Okay. okay. Tear up. <laughs> All right. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> You're human. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. Yeah, so if you want the second page, you're going to have to make an investigation online. Yeah. No, we'll, 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 we'll make it right. I have it at home. So, so when I'm tapping with somebody, we're going to tap through the full series of points. And it's, and it's just this piezo electrical effect, right, that's going to charge, communicate to my brain to communicate to the organs, hey, the, it's not an emergency. And we can go through all the points. So, you, so, so right now, let's just, and then, and then I'm going to turn the time over to you. And I want to hear, we want, I want to hear everything you got to say. So, so you just tap this karate chop point, and you can, you can look up. So, so this is small intestine, small intestine. So we're going to be, we're going to be talking about. So what, when I'm processing with somebody, we'll be tapping on the points. They may tell me about some traumatic event, and then uh, we'll take deep breaths. And we'll go through the points. The next one, the crown. Like it says, 100 meeting points. Jack Hamfield's a one-handed tapper, but you can use both hands. Um, if I'm holding this paper, I would use both hands. Inner eyebrows, the bladder and kidneys. And it's, it lists the emotions that resonate with these. No one ever said to us growing up that you you're emotionally resonate in certain areas of your body more. Right? Certain emotions are associated with certain organs. Then the outer eyebrow, gallbladder, liver, under eye. A lot of people, when I'm tapping with them, for the first time, they'll say, I used to do that. I already do that. I already do that. We do this unconsciously. Stomach, spleen. We rub our faces a lot when we're under stress. We massage our faces. Under your nose is your brain governing vessel. Under your lips, brain conception vessel. Collarbones. Under your collarbones is your kidneys. Right? Okay, then you got under your arm. Which we don't okay. I think it's your lung, your, I think it's your lung is and intestines. And then the back of your hand is your um, it's your it's another part of your flight or flight system. Mm -hmm. So many terms in my head right now. Yeah, see, so you, you, it's, it's either side of your butt. So, uh, your pinky is your heart. Your index finger is your, um, I think it's your large intestine. Your middle finger is your, is your lungs. Okay? Good. Your thumb is also another, uh, is one of the other points too. Okay, so you're going to have all five fingers involved. Okay? Okay, and then, and then we will combine the tapping with a conscious conversation. 
So we will actually go through and dissect an, a traumatic event while tapping. Okay? This picture is what's going on in the brain at the same time. This, this is the frontal cortex, the red part, which is dysfunctional. In other words, the electrical flow and the energetic flow in the brain of somebody with a severe anxiety disorder such as PTSD, it's not operating. It's simply not being utilized. It's not being maximized. So this is four sessions, and the blue represents normal ratio of wave frequencies. Again, wave frequencies, emotions, right? Emotions are changing here. After eight sessions, 12 sessions, this is the fight, flight, or freeze brain. So when we're tapping, somebody is going into the front of their cortex. And so why does that matter? It matters because we're, we're creating new neural pathways. I'm using, together with you, we're, we, we have this relationship where you feel safe with me to explore something horrifying, and we're going to take you to a brain state where you get to review and reprocess the same event instead of why we don't go back here. Because if you don't have proper technique, people just reinforce the vomit back here. Fight, flight, or freeze garbage. You just re-injure yourself. So that's why, and I, I said that in a previous meeting, that's why so many therapists are just, their tans are tied because they know they've got to that traumatic thing. I guess we can't talk about it because we talk around it, and, but I know they're gonna have a panic attack if we bring it up, and so there's just too much. But this process that I'm introducing you to, I'll, I'll have the person do a trauma timeline, starting from the earliest points in their childhood, and work forward. Because the, early the adverse childhood experience, ACE, is the foundation for everything later on. So we want to build forward to get somebody all the way up mentally to where they actually operate now, right? The power of now, instead of being stuffed with the past. Okay, so that's what's going on. And uh, I want to turn the time over to you. I might cool. throw yeah. some things in here, but we're going to go a little long. So if anybody has to go, I just, yeah, cool. It is okay. what it is, man. Keep going. We're um, stuffing them with science. Well, well, uh, if that's what you want to call it, I mean, <laughs> we need to stand around. So let me actually, I just want to draw something. Go ahead and erase okay. it. Um, so, so when David introduced me to, so pharmacist, total left brain, scientific thinker, medical world, right? This is, this is, this is who you get. Um, and uh, so when David introduced me to tapping, okay, I was like, what was your first thought? You know what? I, I, so I've been a self-help kid since I was young. So I was like, you know what? I'm in, David. Whatever you got for me, bud, let's work but through this. But you were this. humble, then. You were in I, a humble place. I, 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 oh, absolutely. Oh, very, very humble. Very humble place. Very, a lot of, of crap happened. And so I was in this place where David's like, dude, let's just come on over. Just come, come hang out with me for a day, you know, for, for a little bit. And let's tap. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> whatever. And I'm, I'm, you know, and, and I'm trying to keep my eyes closed and breathe because that's what you're supposed to do. And I'm like watching. I'm like, oh, crap. I'm, not to, to, oh, he moved, he's supposed to be here, you know, and so, you know, at first I'm just like, what is this? Now, at the same time, it's, it's, it's a tool, it's a tool, so and I'm going to hand this around, I actually carry this around, this is, this is a, a, one of my favorite blends of essential oils, it's a blend, I blend it myself, I call it the yay oil, it's my happy oil, so I'm going to pass this around, just smell it, rub it on you, I mean, whatever you want to do, and then at the end, I'm going to ask you, like, what do you think about it? What's the best place to rub it? it to absorb it? You know, anywhere. Really, it's going to absorb real good. I like okay. to do wrists, neck. I don't know. Okay. Really care. Just kind of slather it on you. <laughs> um, but this is a tool. What's it? It's just your blend. It's it's called the, it's, I call it my yay. yay. My yay blend. Yay. Yay. Y-A-Y. -Y. I don't even know what that's like. Anyway, my yay blend. Now, this triggers, essential oils actually absorb in molecularly, they trigger different parts of the brain. It is a tool wow. in the tool chest. So I'm not opposed to things that David taught or teaches, and I remember thinking, okay, well, uh. so, so the second we got done, I'm like, David, like, could you give me a little more info? Like, how does this work? Why does this work? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I started digging myself. Now, I'm gonna actually draw, and it's gonna be a poor drawing, I know, but uh, this is the brain. This is the brain in your head, and this is our spinal cord, okay? And when you break down, so this is as I've known about tapping for 
a year and a half, maybe two years, David, um, the more that science comes out, the more you're like, oh my gosh. So this is what we call the hind brain, okay? The hind brain. The brain is really divided up into three sections uh, based on uh, uh, scientific mapping that they do. The hind brain is the most prehistoric brain. This is dinosaur brain. This is alligator brain. This is uh, snake brain. This is, this is, this is um, stay alive. That's all it is, is stay alive. This is your, your innate sense of, of, of staying alive, right? Um, now, the midbrain is what we call the midbrain is our emotional, maybe our emotions or emotional brain. And the front brain is our, uh, what I would say, our um, conscious reasoning, so our reasoning. And this might be small, I don't know if you can even see it, but um, so this is your prehistoric brain. 35 million years ago, they estimate it was developed. 35 million years ago, okay? This is, then it evolved into having a midbrain, which is things like dogs, cats, and horses. M the mammalian brain is what they call it, the mammal brain. Go ahead and grab that. So the mammal brain, now, dogs, cats, horses, you can, you can look in their eyes. Now, I'll, I'll ask you guys who, who may, have, may not have done this. A dog may not be able to speak. They might not have this reasoning frontal portion of speech. This I, I would also put in as speech. Um, but when you look into their eyes, they have emotions. Mm. They care. A dog, you can tell when it's pain or it's hurt or it's, it's loving or it's a horse, same thing. Now, More than humans often. Yeah, now, <laughs> now, what about the hind brain? Have you guys ever looked into a reptile brain or a reptile's eyes? You guys ever looked into snake's eyes? Mm -hmm. or, or an alligator size? It's cold. It, it, <laughs> it's cold. Did, did you say that? I said yeah. Oh, it's cold. It, it's, it's like lifeless. It doesn't care. It's just, it's all, it's mere purpose is I'm alive. <laughs> and I'm not dead. And I'm not in pain. I'm alive. And then you get into this, this midbrain, which is the mammalian brain. And then until it, it, it evolved into having reasoning and speech and things like this. So when thinking about this, Again, and, and I love how David said this, we can, we can reason through our problems. We can say, oh man, I gotta be stronger. I'm not gonna eat that cake. Mm. But the midbrain and the, the hindbrain actually take over, it dominates. So, so it would be like, and, and I remember re, um, watching a cartoon once, or reading a cartoon, and this guy was talking to his dog and he was like, Rover? How dare you chew my shoe up, and you should never eat my shoe. Rover, you need to be a better dog. And then it goes, it pans to Rover, and Rover, all Rover hears is blah, 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 blah. Rover, blah, 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 Rover, blah, 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 right? So that's how the mammalian brain, you, you can't physically tell your brain, don't eat that cake, or, or don't get angry. Good. But what helps with an animal? It's okay, we'll, we'll get it. But what happens with an animal? If you were to pet Rover and say, hey Rover, quit eating my shoe and oh boy, I'm just so angry, but you know what? You gotta be a good dog, right? It's that pet, the touch, that, that, that gets through to these, to these other brains. It's that touch. So think about this. When I learned this, and again, I don't even know if this is out there, you're touching. You're literally, okay, so you're telling your brain, don't eat that cake. So I'm sure in, in, in uh, a Nick Ortner, uh, you know, losing weight uh, with Jessica Ortner or some of these other pain, you're going to talk through it. You're going to say, man, don't eat that cake, Justin. You can't succumb to that feeling of wanting to eat cake. But then you're touching, you're stroking, you're loving, you're telling that mammalian brain, look, you got this. Mm -hmm. so, so even on a scientific level, it is a tool in the tool chest that can help actually penetrate into the midbrain and the hindbrain. Now, epigenetics, real quick, epigenetics, epi means upon, genetics means our genes. So within our genetics, there's, there's, there's tons of, of what we call epigenetics. So from what we eat, we'll flip things on. What we do, we'll change how we do it. We, we call it our genes, is a, and, and this is a poor way to say it, I know, but our genes is like having a loaded gun. What we do is what pulls the trigger. So we may have family disposition for diabetes, but if we don't eat that diet that causes diabetes, guess what? 
we'll never pull the trigger to actually have diabetes ourselves. Um, it's, it's so a lot of these things, you know, alcoholism runs in my family. It is genetically in me. It's that loaded gun ready to get me if I pulled the trigger and actually drank. But guess who doesn't drink? Because I have seen it destroy my uncles who are still in and out of prison. Some of my aunts who are still in and out of divorces and, and relationships, like, I don't want that, so I don't pull the trigger. So um, tapping can actually help reverse or, or, or upregulate is, is the term. Uh, over 72 different epigenetics from immune system, so it'll actually boost the immune system, raise your pain threshold, or lower your pain feeling, um, uh, weight loss, autoimmune issues, stress, anxiety, depression. I mean, so many things. And I love the, the emotions book, but, uh, how emotions Oh, go ahead, please. Well, so, are, is, is there a suggestion that we're mo so you're saying we're modifying ourselves on a on a permanent basis, or or this is like this is me going forward. I'm modifying my the operation. Of, of yeah. So, so I would say, and again, one time tapping, you may not upregulate it enough to actually notice it or feel it, but doing it enough long enough, month after month, year after year, you could actually change your physiology, change who you are, right? Is that, does that answer? Yeah, and I'd be interested, I wonder, because, because we've talked about PTSD being able, be, you, people being able to inherit PTSD. It'd be interesting to know if I upgrade myself epigenetically, and then I have offspring. Would it? Does that, pass do they them. get to, do I get to pass on those attitudes, those improved? Nice uh, point. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm interested in it, that. I, I would say, you know, that Because the be suggestion, awesome. isn't the suggestion that there are, there, you said there were 72, what was it? 72 known uh, uh, epigenetic, that are, that are upregulated, 72 genes. Genes, or, see, because that makes it sound like there are cloudy areas of our genes that are, up to debate, almost like yeah. okay. Depending on how, because Lamarck yeah. was Lamarck was the one everybody made fun of when it came to the theory of evolution, because he said the reason why the giraffe has such a long neck is because it was stretching to get the food, and it kept stretching and kept stretching, and people made fun of him because they said, "Oh, that's Lamarck." He's saying that you can change your generation by stretching and by st stretching, and that that's going to be passed on to your offspring. That's exactly kind of what it sounds like with epigenetics is in a way that I'm going to modify my DNA and it has an impact on my offspring. Or it's, it's, it's not just changing me, it's yeah. changing these, there's these cloudy areas of things that can change in a single generation. And I would say yes. I mean, uh, 72 I, genes are upregulated. Now, yeah. how are you when you had that kid? How were you emotionally when you passed on that gene? You know, were you in a bad place, a good place, you know? Yeah. You know, so, so. I don't Mother's know. pregnant, yeah. and and it's unfortunate that most people make these changes later in life after they are done procreating. Mm -hmm. But anyway, reprogramming it sounds like another word that would fit. You're reprogramming your own program. Yeah. There is another study, please, that does get into what you're talking about, but this is not the time to really get into it because they even they go so far as not only are you changing your DNA, which we've talked about before. But you clear up, as you know, we talk about passing on for seven generations, et cetera, all these traits. Yeah. They say actually you can clear it and go back 30 generations and clear that energy forever and ever from your own future. Yeah, offspring. Brad Nelson is, is the emotional code. Yeah. Uh, Dawson Church did the genie in your genes. So Dawson Church, yeah. if we got Dawson Church in here, I think he would make the argument that, that the epigenetics is, is going to, you're modifying yourself. You're genetically enhancing yourself. Which I love. Whereas Brad Nelson is going to go the spiritual route that this is part of your genealogy. Yeah, and so, I mean, in, in conclusion, I mean, this is just one simple little piece, but every time science catches up to it, and that's what you said, mm -hmm. I feel like science is finally catching up to a point where us left brainers, you know, yeah. people who, I, I did it, I experienced the results of it, and I said, there's got to be something to this. Yeah. This isn't just a, a cult of people standing around, you know, again, we were in your office, it, Big Wolf, it's not like we were doing anything other than hanging out, you know, but 
it worked on me. And so I said, wow. And so as I'm at these conferences when science is explaining things like this, and I'm like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yes, that makes sense. And yes, finally it's caught up to it, you know. And, and again, so, yeah. you know, I, 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 you know, selfishly I wanted to teach this for other people who might just want to grasp it a little bit. Um, but also, hopefully somebody watches this and says, <laughs> you know, oh, wow, it's not so yeah. paganistic, you know. Well, what you do if you're, you're helping somebody, right? That person, if it's this guy, said he loved you, then what would you feel? He said he loved me? Good. I don't know. What's the question? Say the question again. Compliment. What if I was working with somebody and the guy said he loved me? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, I love you, bud. No, would you take a sexual? No. Of course not. Okay. So, uh, when, when you were talking about the things that are being satisfied here, we were talking about, say, a dog or this, 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 more, this more primitive part of ourselves um, that need, has other needs in order to learn or to be open to things. Um, in success principles, they talk about auditory, visual, and kinesthetic. You hear it, you see it, and you feel it. Okay? You've got, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing this process with this teacher who's doing this thing with me and seeing me and being seen. I'm hearing and speaking the words. I'm hearing myself say it as well as hearing somebody who really supports me and I'm feeling it. So that, that, that this is going to help that brain. It helps to satisfy that. It helps that, that, that part of us. Uh, that you're I believe that, that that part of us it's kind of tapping into all these things, you know. So that's anything. Uh, other other points that you wanted to bring up. You what was it you were saying about uh, an hour? Is there some specific? Oh yeah. So so they say an an hour uh, of of EFT is equivalent to like ten years worth of of just uh, uh, affirmations. So so you can say whatever you want. You can say. Hey boy, I, I'm, I'm 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 yeah. I'm skinny, and you know, and, and this is obviously somebody who say it isn't skinny, but they would say, you know, I'm skinny and I love my body. Well, that doubt in their brain, and this is where I, I teach some of my people is if you have an affirmation and you say something, it, it, it's what some people call the, the tail. If your body says, <laughs> you gotta be kidding me. Do you really believe that hump of crap that you're saying to yourself, right? Like I'm a millionaire, I'm rich. And if you're not, if you're in the depths of, of poverty and your brain goes, are you kidding me? How are you going to say that? Psych. Like, <laughs> like, now, that's, you, this is this portion that you're using. You're using your speech, your reasoning, saying, I'm going to affirm to myself that I am skinny and I am amazing and I love myself. And you know what? You may have that tail that says, uh-uh. That's when you want to use tapping. Tap through. That. And David's is the best at saying, you know what? I may not feel rich right now even though you know I want to be rich you know I made yeah. so that's the psychological reversal whatever your butt and, and, and there's another quote Sorry. I didn't I yeah. didn't I didn't give you from from Tolly the other quote from Tolly is he says when it comes to the body and the mind whatever the body is pumping out as far as emotion that's the one you that's the truer one to you okay your willpower can say I, I, I want this I want this I want this but if your body feels differently, that's telling you there's a deeper emotion and a deeper thought that feels more true to you. Okay, that's so that was what we would call psychological reversal, which we're going to acknowledge in the process. So if somebody's like just doesn't even want to do their trauma timeline; they don't even want to start. I could say, even though I feel really silly and this feels really dumb, let's do it together. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So we'll give you an example. And again, an hour of this, you guys, is, is equivalent to 10 years of saying, I know, I, I love myself, I love myself, I love myself. Okay. This is, so, so, so this is what I say. You play client. Okay. Right. Deep breath. Even though. Even though. I'm a science guy. I'm a science guy. And I'm a businessman. I'm a businessman. And it's important. It's important. That I have that respect. That I have that respect. That people trust my background. That people trust my background. That I base myself in science. That I base myself in science. And research. And research. And not woo-woo. And not woo-woo. Mm -hmm. And not paganism. And not paganism. I choose now. I choose now. To be open. To be open. 
to the science of tapping. To the science of tapping. And I choose to be open. And I choose to be open. To whatever the truth is. To whatever the truth is. And whatever works. And whatever works. And I choose to have every arrow. And I choose to have every arrow. In my quiver. In my quiver. For helping people to heal. For helping people to heal. Succeed. Succeed. And grow. And grow. Even though. Even though. It's weird. It's weird. And it's different. And it's different. And it's unusual. And it's unusual. And I didn't grow up doing this. I didn't grow up doing this. I choose to be open. I choose to be open. To whatever science is revealing. To whatever science is revealing. And I know I am open. And I know I am open. And I know I've had results. I know I've had results. Even though. Even though. There's some people out there. Some people out there that are going to really struggle. That are going to really struggle as they watch this. As they watch this, <laughs> and they're not going to want to do it. They're not going to want to do this. I choose to love them anyway. I choose to love them anyway. And I choose to be available. And I choose to be available when they're ready. When they're ready. And because I know your belief system, I say these things. I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, chi breaths. Yeah. Well, again, and going scientific, you guys, um, when we shallow breathe, most 90 to 95% of Americans just breathe like this yeah. all day long, all day long. That is putting you in that fight or flight. Your cortisol is reduced. If you can just sit there and breathe, even just do that, not even do this, but just go, you will actually put yourself into rest and digest. Just start, start with cheaper. Just start with cheaper. That's right. I tell I tell my clients again. I've got to keep it non woo woo, you know, because some people aren't ready. But I say, look, when you're eating, eat, put your fork down, chew thirty times, and breathe at least three times before you take your next breath. You'll be fuller faster. You'll absorb your food because you'll be in rest and digest. You guys. You guys know the Mexican I can't tradition. Do that. I'm American. That's I know. Yeah. Because people eat so fast. Again, they're not absorbing. I got stuff to do. They're shallow breathing <laughs> yeah. while they eat. Now, good, good the stuff. siesta, the Mexican siesta, they have so many health benefits attributed to the siesta. Uh -huh. I, I doubt it's because of the siesta itself, but because they're actually, they, you know, family Take time. Take the time. Breathing, probably that nap, you know, wow. midday nap or something. But again, if you just breathe while you eat, put that fork down, you just breathe three times, you will absorb more of that food. You'll feel fuller faster. You won't eat nearly the portion that most people do, and and you're you're happier. And, and now, I now when you're doing this, he'll say, okay, breathe. You know, and you're just breathing and you're just talking and you're you're just outside of the the fight or flight system. So even just being in this rest and digest for two minutes. Is so so powerful. Yeah, um, when people haven't been breathing and they start breathing, they they'll say, "I feel better." That'll just relax. I get people that go, "Man, I'm like headed." Yeah. Because guess.